Um, well, <laughs> my goodness, now this kid gets sarcasm in another language at nine years old. Never mind that he dropped into my class, half, half of the class, like kicked the door in, eating ice cream, give the kid an A, because my goodness, to be able to articulate yourself. So, you know, so again, teaching, and these were kind of like the wild kids, difficult to control, but sometimes you just get a, a moment like that, just, you just, just knocks your pants off, and you just you just have to admire them, so. Hi there, you're listening to ATOT English Abroad, a podcast by the TEFL Org. My name's Ewan Davidson, and in this podcast series, we're gonna be talking to people who have taught English as a foreign language, language, find out where it's taken them and what they've learned from it. So whether you're an aspiring TEFL teacher, you're studying a TEFL course, or you're interested in teaching English more generally, this is a podcast for you. We'll be covering a range of topics each week from travel and accommodation to the nitty gritty of teaching, all while taking a look at global teaching and the quirks of TEFL life. Uh, I'm excited to say today I'm joined by Richard Cullen, Hello. Who, is an experienced te- who is an experienced TEFL teacher and an advisor with the TEFL org. Uh, Richard started his TEFL journey in 2008 when he went to teach in Costa Rica and some other parts of Latin America. He was subsequently offered a job with EF in Nanning, China. Richard worked there as a teacher, then as a senior teacher, then as a director of studies. Later, he embarked on a European tour, going to Spain and Italy, before going back to Hong Kong to lecture at university. Then Richard joined the TEFL org and now works remotely from St. Lucia. Now, uh, given that I'm working in Scotland and I'm wearing a fleece uh, and you're wearing a t-shirt, I'm guessing <laughs> the move was a good one uh no regrets so far you had no regrets so far uh, <laughs> if anything it's a little bit too hot at the moment so i've had to put my uh my headphones in to get over the noise of my ceiling fans um which is a problem i can live with for the time being for sure so yeah so so far so good cool cool so i mean how, how long have you been in st lucia now is that has that been a few weeks or? no i've been here just over a week now um so right. yeah it was it was okay. a week on sunday so um obviously st lucia being a country where they they speak english um the the, the transition has been a little bit easier than some of the other moves i've made before um not having to pick up a language uh you know from day one or find a translator on day one for example so yeah, I think acclimatization into the culture has been a lot easier, but um, there's no escaping that this is firmly within the tropics. And uh, yeah, coming from north of Scotland, or not hailing from, but coming from the north of Scotland myself, it's been uh, a lovely shock. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. Um, so I wanted to ask how it all began. Um, you took up TEFL in 2008, was it? Um, and how, how quick did everything happen before the Costa Rica opportunity opened up? Um, yeah, I mean, this is actually a question I get um, consistently during my uh, during my weekly role as, as an advisor here is kind of how quickly can you actually get gain some traction within the TEFL industry upon completing your um, your qualification. Now, it's not quite appropriate for me to compare exactly my paradigm now uh, sorry back then to what it was now because i mean we're, we're talking a long long time ago when there weren't really um courses such as the one that we offer here that are really robust online courses which offer the flexibility of study you know back then it was a case of more or less you 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 do a sit down course um whether you do that sit down course in the uk or you do it overseas was up to you um my uh main motivation other than costa rica being one of the most biodiverse countries in the world as a big nature lover um one of my main motivations was to actually go and learn spanish so i chose to take my tefl qualification in a spanish-speaking country um and again Mm -hmm. for that opportunity i was offered the um the option of staying in the tefl center where we were training where they had dorms which is where nine out of ten or of the other uh, course participants uh, resided, I wanted to learn Spanish. So I actually went to stay with a a host family, which was, this is a story I often tell for people to ask about, you know, learning the other language and adapting to cultures. Um, It's going to be horses for courses with TEFL um, and certain places are going to suit certain people more than others. But for me, um, I wanted to throw myself in at the deep end. uh, And I think it's a really good attribute to have if you are going to be a teacher at all but a TEFL teacher particularly where you you know you're going to be venturing overseas potentially and to you know not be a toe dipper be a deep end diver um get right in get stuck in um coming back to the point yeah I mean it was it was it was really fun to actually go to a Spanish-speaking country with absolutely no English whatsoever uh communicate with a home a host family who didn't speak any English either their 13 year old was the closest thing we had to sort of a translator uh within the house and 
that actually set me up really well for being a TEFL teacher because you had to start exploring all of these multimodal communication techniques. I was miming, drawing, um, mouthing, you know, my, uh, my repertoire grew quite quickly in terms of my communicative repertoire just from actually, um, you know, jumping in at the deep end. But the, you know, the question you asked how quickly I actually went from gaining the TEFL qualification to work it was actually a bit longer than you'd expect to even think, you know, even being in the country, uh, you know, a country such as Costa Rica, where there is a, a fairly high demand uh, for, for, for English teachers. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the things I learned first and foremost was that there is actually quite a big difference between American and British English, not just linguistically, but actually in terms of what students want to learn, depending on where they're going. So I actually found there were a lot of jobs in Costa Rica and most of the people on my TEFL course actually got a job much more quickly than I did because they were all Americans. I was the only Brit on the course. Um, right, so okay. that was interesting. Um, obviously, the, the students wanted or most of the students from Costa Rica were going to be studying, working uh, in, in, in the States. So therefore, they had the preference for an American teacher. So. It actually took me a good sort of two or three months of bumming around on the beach until my money had nearly run out before I was uh, offered an opportunity in, in, the, in the capital in San Jose, which was working for a, a private ac academy. Um, it wasn't particularly well paid, but it was it was giving me the opportunity to stay in Costa Rica. Uh, the quality of life uh, compared to the cost of living, um, you know, was, was great. So you had a really, though you didn't have a lot of income, you didn't have a lot of outgoings either. And we still had a lot of downtime to go and explore, you know, the Costa Rica as a whole. But typically you'll find that most TEFL teachers can get work within sort of four to eight weeks of uh, completing their certificate or their course. That's typical. That's, I mean, <laughs> first question, we've all got, already got an amazing anecdote there. I love that. Um, so you say that you explored Latin America a little bit. Um, so let's let's break that down a little. Um, where, where else did you go in Latin America? Because it sounded like you were really settled in Costa Rica, but was it sort of the sense of wanderlust that took over? Um, yes, I think so. There, there was, you know, being based in... in being based anywhere in the world gives you the opportunities to explore other neighboring countries. So, you know, one of the, the good mm -hmm. things about Costa Rica is its, is its location. Um, and there are, you know, we had Panama to the south and Nicaragua to the north. So we were doing, they call them border runs back then, but it was basically just to get your visa renewed. It was nothing illegal, but you had to leave the country to come back into the country. This was before I gained work. Sure. So that was a great opportunity to go and explore Nicaragua, to go and explore Panama as well. Um, I actually managed to pick up a bit of work in, in Nicaragua, um, but that was volunteering. It was volunteering for a local church that organized some English classes and they gave me free oh, cool. board, free food. Um, as I said, it, it was volunteered, so it wasn't paid, but you had everything that you needed. And um, again, coming back to one of the questions I often get asked initially for a TEFL teacher, take any opportunity you can get because experience is experience. It doesn't matter if it's experience online, experience face-to-face, -face, if it's paid, if it's volunteered, it all counts as experience. It's all gonna make you a more confident and efficient teacher. Um, and more importantly, the longer you can actually uh, complete a job overseas, even if it is, um, uh, as I said, a volunteer or a low paid position, once you've gotten that six months or 12 months onto your CV, that's a huge risk factor taken away from your your employability in terms of other schools because we could come onto it later mm -hmm. on. But when I was hiring teachers, one of the you know one of the first things I would look for um, with experience was you know had they actually had the ability to complete a contract in another country to fulfil a commitment to actually adapt and to stay in that country for a long time because you know, not only are you taking on all of this new career, these new skills as a teacher, but then you have to try and adapt to a completely new country, new language, new environment, foods. And, you know, that's mm -hmm. two things to really, really, two very, very difficult balls to juggle for, for, for some people, you know, for, for a lot of us, it's, it's a lot to take on. Um, and therefore, if you can kind of just get that first year through, um, even if it's, you know, you might find your perfect job straight away. A lot of my friends did, but you might find a job which is, only say meeting two or three of your five criteria that you're ideally looking for, um, go for it still because then once, then once you've demonstrated your ability to, to fulfill a commitment, to fulfill a contract, to stay and adapt to another country, 
you're so much more employable to employers uh, moving forward. And it's that side of the experience just as much as the actual teaching side of experience, which can be important to potential schools, especially those who are uh, attracting foreign, uh, foreign, foreign teachers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the Nicaragua, a bit of volunteering, Panama, no work in there. Um, I was in Mexico for a couple of months and again, there picked up a bit of volunteer work, but that was actually working for a local business. It was a hotel. So going in and right. uh, teaching their, their staff, but that had come about because I was staying in the hotel, got talking to the events manager, I think it was, who wanted to improve right. his daughter's English and therefore one thing led to another. So again, it's going to come back to the same old story of put yourself in the situation, get out there, talk to people, network, and you'll find, I mean, like that job again in, in Mexico, I wasn't getting paid, but I was there. If my hotel room was paid for, my meals were then paid for again. So it allowed me to stay near to, it was in the, uh, the, the peninsula near to Cancun. It's a very, very tropical area as well. I just kind of got to have a, a few, a few months of tropical lifestyle for, for free. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my extent of the teaching in, in, in Latin America, I think. Mm -hmm. And so you've described a kind of range of different students there. So I was going to originally ask, like, what are students like in Latin America? But it's a very sort of broad thing. Um, but you, you did go to Asia later in your career, and we're going to get onto that in the next question. But, you know, from everything we've heard from guests who've, who've been to Asia, there's a real culture of respect uh, for, for teachers. Um now, obviously, because of the different kinds of work that you did, it's, it's hard to make generalizations again. But what was the impression that you got from people that you were teaching? Was there, was there a real kind of desire and uh, respect there? Yeah, I think that's that's a, that's a really, it, it is a broad question, but it's, it, you, you, it, mm -hmm. I think it can be answered. I mean, there, there are going to be slight nuances within cultures all over the world. Um, I noticed that the chattiest students were actually in Spain and Italy, not so much in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Um, so sort of classroom management was much more of an issue uh, in Europe than I found than it was uh, in Latin America. There, the students were highly motivated. Again, it was, you know, a lot of them are needing it for, for business or for, for university. So therefore, they already have that motivation within them to learn. So I, I found that the, you know, classroom management for a TEFL teacher isn't so much about crime and punishment and reward. It's actually more about how you set up your activities, how you check for understanding, how you use concept questions, how, uh, how aware you are of the students' um, understanding of what you're trying to get them to do. Uh, that sort of, you know, so you don't actually have to spend a lot of the time disciplining students, um, you know, looking at, you know, naughty, naughty students, so to speak. I mean, there are chatty students and there are quiet students. You've always got a range of multiple intelligences within any, any cohort that you teach. Um, but mm -hmm. often people do cite the fact that particularly in Asia, the students have this real strong desire, this, this really high, uh, you know, ethics with education. Um, that's true. But then you kind of, you also in China, a lot of the time you're going to be teaching young uh, young kids. There's a lot more kids. The, the, the kids market back then especially was much bigger in China. Therefore, these kids aren't as motivated because it's their parents who are pushing them to do it. They've maybe already had a cello, an extra math, um, another language class after their usual school. And then they're coming to the English class. So what we had to, what, what I had to do then was actually just try and create much more varied classes, lots of short, sharp, bursting activities, lots of activities that the students like, or I don't like to use the term, but games, game teacher, game teacher, game teacher. So as long as your games actually did have a learning outcome, um, then you find that classroom management was more noticeable in China, but the way that you negate it is to prepare your classes accordingly. Um, so yeah, I think that there is a bit of a myth that Asian students are much more dedicated to their, to their study. Um, I think it depends particularly on the age range that you're, that you're teaching and again, you know, the motivation to learn. So yeah, within, um, within my, my, my teaching jobs in Latin America, there were some kids there. And again, we had similar problems to what you to those that you'd experience in China, but I found that the, the kids were probably less academically overwhelmed in that part of the world than they were in Asia. Therefore, they were a little bit more, 
Uh, yeah, they, they had more motivation for the classes. Sometimes the, the kids in China could be not a problem, but as I said, you really had to think quite carefully on your lesson plans on how to actually, you know, keep the students engaged and, and you know, uh, ma maintain their interest. But then when you're teaching at higher levels and university and adult levels, then you tend to find that obviously the the, the, the learning will be dictated by the students, um, you know, what their desire is and motivation to learn English. And usually it's, it's you know, they, they need it for one purpose or another. Therefore, they are, I mean, generally speaking, I've never encountered any cohort or group uh, apart from the tobacco factory in China once. Uh, that's a story for another day where they really went to learn English. And that was that was like watching paint dry for a few weeks. Um, but other than that, no, we've, uh, I've always found motivated students uh, anywhere I've been in the world. And again, it really just depends on, you know, their own um, motivations for learning. Amazing. So um, after that, you moved to China. Um, now, where you went, Nanning, um, it isn't quite as well known in the West as Shanghai or Beijing or all these like, you know, mega cities. Um, so I phrase this as, could you talk us through what it's like there for people who don't know? I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to have any knowledge on Nanning at all. Um, what's, uh, what kind of size of city is it? What's, it? what's it like? Well, let me put it to you this way. Um, when I first moved to Nanning, there were about five and a half million people and there were 121 mm -hmm. registered foreigners in the city I see. so it okay. was very much um i mean first and foremost i wasn't actually considering china i had my heart on i was studying spanish i was happy in latin america um the only problem was there wasn't loads of work there at the time and my cv had been floating around online for a few weeks and ef english first who i'm, I'm sure many of our listeners have, have come across before they're you know a huge uh, franchise over in china uh they approached me online and offered me an interview uh, at first i wasn't keen because it was china and i wanted to stay in south america um but i thought you know i'm not one to turn down an opportunity and talk is free so we thought well, we'll, we'll have this it was back then it was a skype interview and it was a a scottish guy who who uh, interviewed me and he was telling me about the role, asking me a bit about myself. I'd had no real experience, no concrete experience, just these little bits and bobs that I've you know, discussed previously. Um, so I wasn't really in, in the habit of turning away any opportunities that were coming my way, but I wasn't keen on China. Uh, how he sold me on China was to tell me that it's pretty much the same um, topography as where I was uh, in, in Latin America, that Nanning is right down on the Vietnamese border. So right in the south, I mean, there are mango trees everywhere, lychees everywhere. It's, it's tropical, subtropical. So he said to me, it's going to be like home from home for you. You'll find the transition smooth. And I said, well, here I spend all day on the beach. He said, the beach is close. The beach is close. Turns out the beach was three hours away, which for China is close. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so... I, I googled the city. I'd never heard of it. I'd never even heard of the Guangxi province. Um, like yourself and, and most of us, I'd heard of Beijing. I'd heard of Shanghai. I hadn't even heard of Shenzhen, to be honest. You know, um, I, I wasn't very uh, in the know about China. But coming back to one of the points that I continuously make with yeah, people, you know, in, in, in my regular job here is, what have you got to lose? What have you got to lose? Um, you know, the, the UK, as far as I know, although it's not in great shape at the moment, it is still there uh, and it will always be there. And I never understood this huge fear in going somewhere that you don't sure that you don't know that you're not sure about. My mum, rest her soul, she used to tell me, always give some, something three, three months, three months, give it three months, give any new place three months. If you really don't like it after three months, then review your options. And I'd lived in quite a few places in a few different roles. I'd lived in different countries as a child before. So, you know, moving to strange places was nothing new to me. But my first night in China was like nothing else I had prepared for back then, especially in a tier three, tier four city, which it was. Um, you know, my first night I, I checked in and the guy who interviewed me picked me up from the hotel. They gave me, they, they paid for, well, they, they paid for my flight. I paid for it, but they reimbursed it within six weeks of working sure. there. They paid for my visa and they offered me an apartment paid for. I wasn't in the habit of turning those things down. And I don't understand uh, some of my teachers and later on uh, in, in my career who would come and complain about the color of their walls in their free apartment, for example. My first apartment didn't have a toilet. It had a, a, a drop 
and it had a stool that you unfold with a hole. Now, not to be too more graphic or descriptive, you can guess what it's used for. So, but yes. my first impression was, oh, that's different. Okay. Yes. I'm not paying for this. I've never been given anything in my life before like this. Who am I to say that this isn't good enough? And, you know, uh, and as with all of the foreigners, after you sort of get your feet under the table, you learn that you can actually, instead of being given free housing, you can actually take a housing allowance instead and then go and find yourself somewhere with a Western flushing toilet and sort of some of the amenities that you'd be more used to. But yeah, I mean, it was it was a shock. So the first night I got greeted with a with a hole in the floor for a toilet. And my boss said, what do you want to eat? And I've come from a, you know, I come from, directly from Costa Rica to China. So I was all over the place through Lally with jet lag. And he just suggested a chicken curry, said sounds good. Um, 20 minutes later, a knock at the door. A guy came with a polystyrene packet with two compartments. One compartment was boiled rice. The other was a chicken curry, but without over-exaggerating, the head of the chicken with the eye sockets and the beak was sitting out of the, the curry when I, when I went to eat it. So my first night, I ate boiled white rice um, and some other bobs yeah. they left in a hamper. Uh, and then, although I don't eat McDonald's back home, my, my first Chinese language acquisition was McDonald's menus. People thought I was absolutely brilliant at Chinese whenever I was in a McDonald's. Um, I'd learn all of the, the names of the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the foods on the menu. But then within a few weeks, you get to know the local, uh, not just the locals, but the teachers who've been there a while. And they start showing you this little secret gem, this little beaut of a dish, this, 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 and this. And now, truly, I don't actually miss that much about China from how much I, I lived there, apart from the food. Ironically, I really, really miss the food in China now. So... Get over that, you know, get over that first impression. Um, and coming back to that point, that, that first night, I called up my mum and I just said, no, this is, this is not for me. China was a bridge too far. Um, it's not for me. And she said, give it three months. And after about a month, wow, I loved it to bits. I was getting on with my Chinese. I checked out all the local tropical areas. We made some really good local friends. Um, the other teachers were really cool. I loved the students and... Perhaps it's something we'll come on to, but joining a company like EF was a really, really good way to go for a new teacher because there's loads of progression, lots of fast tracking opportunities and so much professional development that just gets input into their teachers as, as, as standard practice that um, it's a really, really good place to go and to, you know, develop early on. So, yeah, it was it was it was it was an eye opener. Um, and, you know, the city, it's something that at times it got frustrating, um, but you would have a lot of people staring at you. You'd have people taking your photograph. You'd have people asking to take their photograph with you if you went out. Now, I'm not a big drinker. And even back in the day, I wasn't a big drinker. But if I did go out to any bars or clubs, you couldn't buy a drink. Everybody would want you to come to their table. And there became a point when you felt a bit like a dancing monkey at times. And you were kind of just, you know, you would have bar owners that would ask um, to pay you money or to give you loads of free drinks if you and the other foreign friends drink at the front of their bar in the window so that, you know, almost like, like some mm. freak show attraction. Um, so there's an element of that, but then there is obviously, you know, the wonder and amazement of people who aren't used to interacting with people from, from other backgrounds and you get to share cultures and you, when you move to a a, a city like that, as opposed to Beijing or Shanghai, where everyone speaks English, where everything's in English, you can get everything you need. Um, it forced me to, A, learn Chinese from, from the ground up, um, which I still speak now. Um, it also taught me a lot more about the real local culture, local practices, rather than going to sort of a more of a, a westernized... I'm not saying you can't experience China and Beijing, of course you can, but I think to go and teach in a tier one city is much, much easier than to go and teach in, in, a, in, in a lower tier city or in a more sort of off, off, off the track city. But more opportunities grow around you. There are less English teachers for you to compete with. So just walking down the street, people are approaching you. Can you teach me? Can you teach my, my kids? Can you teach X, Y, Z? I'll come into my business. My staff need teaching. And there's a lot of scope to, um, we would call them VIPs, you know, your private students. So you can double your earning potential. Um, I'm not saying you can't do that in a tier one city. The opportunities are there but there's more competition. And again, you know, if you look at cities like Nanning or, you know, equivalent cities that are slightly more off the beaten track, the cost of living plummets. Um, and you tend to find that actually your wages 
far outweigh the cost of living and that each month you've got savings, money to travel. You know, being in southern uh, China as well was great. You could get the bus over to Vietnam. I got the bus from Vietnam to Cambodia and to Laos. Um, again, all, all in one trip. Um, and being, wow. uh, being in somewhere like China, they, they celebrate a lot. They celebrate a lot of things out there. You get this day and that day and all the time. The teachers are always getting time off work for it. So, you know, it's I, I don't think I've ever had a job other than Spain. The, the one job I had there, which was just a fairly nuanced job that really took up all of my time, didn't really allow me any free time, didn't give me the chance to actually get out there and explore the country. You know, every TEFL job I've had has afforded that opportunity. But being based in a, you know, a small city in the south of China was was fantastic for those reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you touched on it a wee bit earlier there. You, you had a really rapid ascent up the ranks um, in Nanning in China. Um, so I have to ask, like, what, what would you say your key strengths are as a teacher? Um, and what advice would you give to people who are motivated to have that sort of upward career trajectory like you, like you discussed there? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There's a few cliche things that you could wrap around this, but it's about being ambitious whilst being humble. Um, you need mm -hmm. to be very, very, very respectful of the local culture where you're working. That's one way to transcend teaching into academic management, which is, you know, the director of studies position is you, you need to be you need to have a really good relationship with your local staff. Um, it's happening less and less or it happened less and less throughout my career, which is a good thing. But I did notice sometimes foreigners would come in with a bit of a chip on their shoulder. They've got very high expectations. They expect X, Y, and Z. And if they don't get X, Y, and Z, then the toys come out the pram. Whereas, you know, my 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 view was, hey, w w w you know, I'm, I'm here to work with you. I'm here to learn from you. Uh, and ultimately, you know, it's the, the, the local staff who are the most important. They're not the foreign teachers. The local staff are still the core of the business there. So you have to be um, really good at working um, with people from all different backgrounds. Uh, you've got to be outgoing. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear that a teacher needs to be outgoing. You know, you, you have to be confident in your own ability, but also confident in your ability to pick yourself up if you make a mistake and not to then dwell on the mistakes. Um, you know, my, my first lesson wasn't a disaster, but my next lesson was 100% better than the first lesson because you learn from experience, you tweak and amend things. But um, you know, coming back to that question in terms of a rapid ascent, sometimes it's times and places, uh, you know, right time, right place, um, opportunity knocks. But also, I think, again, if you if you demonstrate um, the, the right attitude, again, we had a lot of teachers who people ask me, you know, do am I too old to TEFL, for example, unless there's a visa requirement prohibiting that, then no, you're not uh, a good teaching team would have different ages and different age groups. I mean, I know from experience when I've tried to build a, a team of young, energetic, you know, uni lever teachers, half the time they're out drinking on the Friday night and can't get up for their Saturday class in the morning and to have to cancel a class is, it's a hanging offense within, within ESL, you know, you don't want that to happen. So my philosophy was I, I never took liberties with the school. I never canceled any classes. I always knew that the priority was my classes that I was always putting in the right amount of effort for lesson planning. I wasn't just coming in 10 minutes before a class, quickly trying to throw together a lesson plan. You know, I, I don't have OCD, but I like to be in control of everything that I'm doing, especially if I'm going to be presenting to people. So I will take a lot of pre-care in making sure everything was, was, was correct and was planned through. And that shows, you know, that, that kind of attitude shows. And so it was fairly fortuitous in that the guy who actually hired me the Scottish guy I referenced before was moving on to become a uh, an IELTS uh, auditor. So uh, yeah, right. do okay, something yeah. slightly different. So I think that ideally I probably should have had another year or two maybe um, to be considered for that role. But because I was, again, without blowing one's own trumpet, I had good feedback from the students, was popular with the students, had a good working relationship with the staff, uh, had missed mm -hmm. the class had you know had demonstrated reliability um and again with china it was a case of knowing how to work within the paradigm you're you know that, that you're playing within i mean it was the private education sector so i understood that on one hand yes we're trying to um you know to educate the kids to deliver a quality service of education but on the other hand it's actually a business which has to turn a profit as well we weren't working in a public school um and i think if you can kind of understand the business from that 
perspective, then you start being more aware of not just doing certain things for your students, but doing things for their parents as well, going the extra mile, to, you know, speaking to the parents, even if you don't speak Chinese, which I didn't maybe at the time, asking your teaching assistant, oh, can I just have a word with, with Jimmy's mum for a moment, just giving them that extra little bit of feedback. Those kind of things get picked up by the school. Um, and those are the kind of things that they want to see for an academic manager, somebody who's not just able to teach, but who's able to work within the sort of parameters and the paradigm of a private education sector. You know, even things like I would make sure that my last activity was always lots of this, lots of lots of noise, lots of movement, lots of English, because that's when the parents will turn up 10 minutes before the end of the class. And if they're all sitting down mm -hmm. doing a cooler activity, which might be appropriate for the lesson, the parents see that and don't think there's much going on. So it's not a case of hoodwinking, but it's knowing how to play the game, you know, and, and to, yeah. uh, to, to appreciate that a lot of the time when you're working within ESL, you won't always be working in a state school. More times than not, actually, you won't. You'll be working within the private education sector, which there is often a bit of a mismarriage in terms of, you know, high quality of education and actually getting the students in bums on seats and turning a profit. So it's understanding that paradigm as well, which I think helped to um, get me to, uh, you know, ascend through the ranks fairly quickly. And being part of a really big, well-structured company like EF, um, EF is a bit like McDonald's, you know, it's a, I don't know, is McDonald's a franchise? <laughs> I don't know, actually. Like KFC, um, it's, it's, a, it's a franchise. Sure. So, you're going to get good ones. You're going to get bad ones. Um, if you only read the negative reviews, then I think you're you're not really giving yourself a chance, you know, for to experience the uh, the benefit of working for a big company. So yeah, you know, at the time, EF had quite a bit of negative press because a few of their schools had underperformed or teachers had had bad experiences here, there, and somewhere else. But my experience with EF was it literally put me where I am today, which is still working in in the industry you know, decades later. So I have, uh, I have nothing but respect for the way that EF actually go around their business model and how well they do uh, develop and potentially fast track their teachers. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's fascinating. I think that's going to really, really help a lot of people as well. Um, so you, that you then you went on to uh, teach in Spain and Italy, uh, places where uh, traditionally, you know, it's, it's harder to find work, certainly for, for newer teachers. You know, someone like yourself, you had experience in a quality CV. Um, if you can, uh, we, we touched on the, um, the educational system you're working in in China. Um, so what were the major kind of cultural differences in terms of everyday living going from China to Spain and then Spain to Italy? Was there a bit of culture shock there? Or, or, or Yeah, it was. Generally speaking, was it no, right? there, there, there was. In, in fact, funnily enough, the, the hardest culture shock out of all of them was the reverse culture shock when I came back to the UK. Um, not to come up, that was actually. And if you teach, if you speak to a, a lot of long-term TEFL teachers or expats who have done whatever and moved back, that actually the the move home back, if you ever choose to move home or back to your country of origin, that's the hardest uh, mm. in terms of a culture right, shock. Okay. Um, it was funny because when I came from China to Spain, I immediately found the local Chinese community within Spain. You know, they still have, you know, right. certain shops, certain restaurants. And I, I found that it was great because I'd be walking down the street speaking in English, Spanish and Chinese before I'd even gotten to the school, which was kind of and then trying to remember going back from Spanish into Chinese. You know, the schemata is there, but you're trying to remember which part to activate. So half the time you're speaking in kind of a chingla spanish language where it's a bit of a mixture of all three of them um the, <laughs> the working culture was the thing that that really shocked me in spain now i can't speak for all of the jobs in spain um but certainly the the job that i had was the hardest in terms of the amount of work that you had to put that that, that had to be put in and again, I think it's probably unfair of me to, to tarnish all of Spain like this, because if you worked for a school or one of the you know, many sort of groups of schools that they've got in Spain, um, you probably have a lot more already there for you. Um, as you did say before, they do prefer their teachers to have a bit more experience there, but not in all cases. Um, but my one no. it definitely was dependent on my experience because it was um, a small a language school that had two or th that had two uh, schools already. They were in the Seville area, but they were just outside, so just sort of in the countryside of Andalusia. And um, 
they wanted to open a third school and they essentially wanted somebody who could come into that third school and do everything. There were no course books, there was no class materials. I had to complete the set up the curriculum, pedagogy and, and assessment all from scratch, all myself wow. whilst teaching because I didn't have a few weeks to do that first. So it was kind of like nine o'clock in the morning, I'd be down there and I would be planning my classes. And again, not all the time, but in Spain, quite often, you'll find that the students you'll teach sort of the three, four, five-year-olds first when they finish school. Then you'll teach the six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds. Then you'll teach the 10, 11-year-olds. And then by the end of the night, you'll be finishing like maybe B1, B2 adult level. You know, back then, maybe I think still now, a lot of the civil service positions in Spain required uh, a B2 level of English. So there were a lot of adults who weren't that motivated to actually study, but had to do it. So yeah, I found that I was kind of getting down to the school at nine o'clock in the morning, not just writing the lesson plans for that day, but creating all of the materials that go with it. Then, you know, um, you know, where's the photocopying machine? We haven't got one. Where's the laminating machine? We haven't got one, right? We need one of those. We need one of those. So it was very much developing a school ad hoc, which was a lot of work, a lot of stress, um, because then you'd have maybe four or five different classes from mid afternoon and you finish maybe 11 o'clock at night and the Spanish being Spanish, they do everything later. So they would ask you, I mean, they were great. My, my best friends in Spain were my adult students. They'd come, oh, so besita, you know, come for a little beer with us after, after class. And then you'd go and you'd have some tapas and maybe a beer, maybe a Coke, whatever with your students and not to be rude, you'd sit with them until maybe midnight. And then you wake up again, nine o'clock in the morning and you've got to mark all of what you've done. So anyway, I'm not painting a, a good picture of Spain here, but that was the <laughs> job that I had. And that was sort of coming back to your point again about the fact that they did want an experienced teacher because there's a lot more autonomy, um, you know, a lot more things that you, you're expected to do yourself there. Not going to be the same for all of the schools, but I would suggest that all of them will have that pattern of the different age groups and all teaching them all in one evening. Whereas in China, it was kind of a couple of classes here, three classes that day, two classes that day. Spain, it was consistently filled up with classes. Um, yeah. And yeah, but it was, it, again, you know, I, I think that probably a year down the line, two, a year or two down the line, it becomes easier because then you've got all of those materials. A lot of teaching is going to be rinse, repeat as well. So once you've you know, got an activity or a lesson plan or you know, some materials which work well, you can just keep reusing them or you can just tweak them a little bit for if it's online or face-to-face -face or tweak them for, for the level. So yeah, it's always kind of that initial lot of work. If there isn't a curriculum, you know, pedagogy assessment, if those things aren't already in place, then there's going to be a lot of work. But um, you know, we're talking more, I suppose, for new teachers here. And I would suggest that, yeah, look for look for schools that already are fairly well established if you don't want to take on too much. Um, I always say to people, um, well, when, when I was hiring for, for, for China, which was a, you know, a huge part of my job for, as, as, the, as, the, as the DOS or the director of studies, as we call it there, was, um, uh, was actually re recruiting recruiting the, the right people that are that are going to come um that aren't that aren't afraid to uh sort of you know create their own materials create their own lesson plans um but yeah you know the 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 main difference with china i think is that you've got a lot of the schools there were a lot more well established um and the point i was going to make is that actually with places like china vietnam anywhere that you're going to need a working visa so more typically Southeast Asian countries. And now please don't ask me about Brexit because it's almost like a swear word in my diction, but I'm not quite sure the paradigm is fluid in Europe at the moment, let's just say. Um, but typically speaking mm -hmm. for countries that require uh, working visas, Middle East and the Far East, you'll find that they actually will put a lot more into their teachers there because it's a big investment for them. It costs time, it costs money to get that teacher over there. Um, sorry, I, I'd forgotten my point and I had to talk my way back onto it, which is a great skill for a teacher. I've remembered what it was now. Um, <laughs> almost forgotten it already then. Um, uh, but as I used to say to any new uh, potential candidate um, who had never heard of Nanning, who'd never heard of Guangxi, um, speak to my current team. I'll give you the email of my current team, speak to my current team, have a chat with them. They're from the UK, they're from Russia, they're from wherever they were from. We had, we had teachers from all over the place, but speak to them about it. See what their life's like here, because, you know, a lot of the teachers that I had, they had been there for three or four years. They've been actually renewing their contracts. They've been staying. And, you know, so you actually, 
I, I wouldn't be afraid to ask a potential school or employer, would it be possible to connect with any of your existing staff? And if they say no, why? You know, why not? That, that, yeah. that, so that's, they might have a reason, data protection, whatever else. But, you know, I was always happy to say, yeah, listen, if you want to leave, you know, if you're happy for me to get one of my team to give you a call or to reach out to you via email, these days even easier with all of the social media and stuff, then um, do that. And, you know, ask, ask my team what, what, what the job's like, what their workload's like, and hear it from, from their mouth, not from mine. Um, and, yeah, that's something I would, you know, I, I would probably advise any, any new teacher to try and do. Don't be afraid to ask that question because if, if it's a good school and they've got nothing to hide, they should have no reason to, you know, not want to share what they do. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I've lost it there a bit, Richard. Hang on. The police sort itself out. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. I think we just had a little uh, blipping connection then. Yeah, I can hear you again. Cool. It was still recording on your end, so it should be fine. I think it's just the connection between the two of us. Um, okay, great. Um, okay, I think we'll take a wee break there, um, and then I'll move this next question after the break. Hold on a second. What you're hearing, and maybe you're wondering if you can teach English as a foreign language too. Well, the answer is yes. And as an exclusive reward for listening to this podcast, we're offering you 50% off TEFL courses, plus a free lesson plans pack to help you get started. Just use the code podcast at checkout. With that discount, you can get TEFL qualified with the world's most accredited TEFL course provider and learn how to teach from teachers. With dedicated tutor support, lifetime access to our TEFL job center and friendly advice from our team of experts, you could be teaching English abroad or online within just a few months. Signing up couldn't be simpler. Just visit www.tefl.org and add the code podcast at checkout to get your discount. That's www.tefl.org. Start your TEFL adventure today. And we're back with Richard Cullen. Um, just before I get back into the questions again, um, this hasn't been too much of an interrogation, has uh, it? No, no. It's uh, as I said, I've, we were just discussing. I'm I'm an English teacher, so talking <laughs> luckily comes quite quite naturally to me. So no, I'm uh, I'm, I'm just happy to uh, hopefully answer some of the questions that a lot of our viewers may have through my own experiences and anecdotes. So no, no, this is. Uh, mm -hmm. This is if it's if it's if it's helpful for anyone that's listening, then please feel free to interrogate away. <laughs> um, so your ability to travel pretty fearlessly, uh, in fact, entirely fearlessly, I would say, and, and take on new challenges is I think that's going to be something that a lot of viewers and listeners would hope for themselves in their career. Um, and it's easy to say, you know, just go for it if you think you can do it. But is it really that simple? And how much does being sociable and approachable have to do with it? Um, as well as being able to deliver quality English lessons. You kind of touched on this before, but I thought I'd ask that kind of directly. Yeah, um, I mean, it's for, for me, I think I had a bit of an advantage in that I was four years old when I first moved continents. So I was I was born in Johannesburg um, during apartheid and then got brought up in Brixton in South London, which was one of the most extreme culture shocks anyone could, could, could experience. Um, Growing up in a really multicultural society like South London um, wet my appetite for other languages, for other cultures. You know, we were eating ackee and saltfish for dinner um, with my friends who are of Jamaican descent, for example. We had kids in my class who were Venezuelan, Chinese. And I think that coming from a, a metropolitan area gave me a bit more... Um, as I said, it, it wet the appetite to actually get out there and experience the other cultures. And I think that I did have, or do have maybe a slight advantage in that I was already used to uprooting and moving along. My mum my and dad moved us around the UK a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, when, when, when we were younger. So, you know, being able to not be a chameleon, it's not about, <clears throat> me, it's not about lying to new people or um, creating a new persona. But being able to just adapt to where you are um, was was a skill which I think I had from 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 young. Um, so that was uh, you know maybe something which gave me a, a, an edge as as as, a, as an English teacher, certainly psychologically, uh, as a, as a TEFL teacher. Sorry. Um, 
but I still think the same applies to to anyone who maybe is uh, a little bit less travelled. Is that I always took the view that we touched upon earlier that the UK is always still going to be there. You know, what's the worst that can happen? Um, you know, and and I think without sounding like a broken record, it really is that point. What's the worst that can happen by going overseas? You know, you can you can you can get into trouble in the UK. You can find danger in the UK. You can you know the, you know if if you want to be silly, you can be silly anywhere in the world. Um, so you know, <laughs> being, being you know being in another country for me, it was all about the excitement rather than the fear. And those two are very very good bed buddies. You know, they obviously go hand in hand. Um, but I think it's trying to focus on the excitement rather than the fear uh, of, of of these new experiences. And yeah, being outgoing, being a fairly interpersonal um, individual like I am does help um, because it means that. But to be honest, though, I haven't always been that way. Um, I, I, I learned from a very young age that people don't really care that much about you. They, everyone cares about themselves. They've all got their own worries and their own issues. So don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about making a fool out of yourself. Be able to laugh at yourself first and foremost. You know, if you can, if you can not take yourself too seriously, that is a really, really helpful attribute to not just teaching English, but to adapting to another country. As I said, you know, in, in, in Costa Rica, drawing pictures and doing silly dances and all sorts of funny faces, just trying to get my point across. Uh, going to southern China where nobody spoke a single word of English uh, and then having to, you know, negate a marketplace. I mean, I, I made the faux pas of learning Do Xiao Chen, which in Chinese means how much is that, before I'd learned to count to 10. So I would ask how much something is. They would tell me and I would look blankly at them. So, yeah, little things like that. But again, and it's seeing the fun in that rather than taking that on and becoming nervous about it. And, you know, most schools, not I can't speak for every single school around the whole world, but most schools worth their salt. They will have a really good induction program there. They will give you a, a local TA or a local member of staff who will help to be your uh, TA for this particularly young students, for example. Or you'll have a local member of staff who will help you do your banking, take you to the hospital, get you set up if you need to rent your own apartment. Um, you know, when I when I used to take new teachers on into China, I would always give them a buddy, which would be one of my more experienced teachers. They would shadow them for the first week or so, observe their classes, have a couple of their own classes observed. They made sure that they are really um, immersing themselves properly and that they're not kind of just isolating themselves in a foreign country, which is kind of the antithesis of what you want to do if you're going over there. You know, you you want to go there and... and Again, I can't speak for everybody. I mean, even here in St. Lucia, you know, the reason I, I, I hope that I come across better with the locals here is that I'm not interested in eating like a foreigner, living like a foreigner. I want to know where they eat. I want to know what they get up to. I want to know how they live. And it's not a case of becoming a local. Um, there are, you know, you're clearly not going to be a local everywhere you, you live, but it's trying to be humble. Uh, and really, I mean, uh, Sunday morning, I said to the guy who, who I rent from, I told him about the big sea urchins that I nearly trod on. And he said, oh, no, no, they're fine. You, you can eat them. Nah, well, then the, ne the next day down at the beach, now I don't even eat fish, but the next day down at the beach, I was swimming around and he was there walking his dogs. And I said, there's these urchins. And he said, well, get me one, pick me one. Cracked it open, pulled out what I can only describe as a booger. It was literally like a dangly booger. Um, and the other guy who he was showing it to was an old guy who was on holiday here at one of the resorts. He was like, ah, me, I thought it looked disgusting. I don't eat fish, but I tried it. And it actually tasted like sweet fruit with an after salt water taste, which was kind of odd. But, you know, that just that little anecdote there is what makes, I think, somebody able to actually get on in a new place. And it's a case of, I don't think I'm going to like that. I'll try it anyway. Who cares? You know, I mean, the things I was offered in China, you wouldn't believe. Um, and it's not to say that I enjoyed eating all of them. And it's not a case of, well, if you don't, you're going to offend people. Uh, people aren't that offended if you're, if you're going to turn down food and, you know, certain customs. But it's a really good idea if you can try and embrace them, if you can try and put yourself into the position that you might make a fool of yourself um, because that just makes you stronger. It makes you more resilient. And actually, it makes you a much, much better teacher uh, because, you know, the students can pick up on a teacher that takes themselves too seriously. Um, 
again, there's a fine line between being a, a clown and an entertainer and actually delivering a, a high quality class and, and, and you know, standard of education. Um, but that's that comes with practice. And you, you only really find out where that line is by getting it wrong a few times, making a fool out of yourself a few times, not taking yourself too seriously. And then self-reflection is super important, both for adapting to a new country, particularly for uh, teaching. You know, you always have to be reflecting, what am I doing well here? What aren't I doing well? What do I need to improve on? How is my life in the country? Do I have a lot of friends here? Have I been to see X, Y, Z? What am I doing with my free time? Am I getting out there? Am I just watching Netflix from China, for example? You know, what, I, can you watch Netflix in China? Not sure. <laughs> it's been, I, they didn't have Netflix when I was in China, so I'm not sure now. But you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a case of, um, yeah. and, and I think that the two, as I said, do go, do go quite, quite closely hand in hand. Mm-hmm. So it's a case of kind of leaving your ego at customs then? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I think that the, the world is a, is, is a much lighter place when you can shed your ego full stop, but it particularly applies to uh, trying to adapt to a new country and uh, to, 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 to presenting to orating or to teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the, um, at the TEFL work now, um, as well as, as teaching, you interact with customers and you give advice on courses. But I'd like to know, what bit of advice do you wish you'd been given before you started your career? Mm. Yeah, you gave me a few questions ahead of this uh, ahead of this uh, chat. And that was the one that was the one that stuck out. And I thought, oh, I don't know, actually, because um, <laughs> I was I was thinking about it. And I think it's to, I'll be honest with you the best advice I could give is the advice I've given. And no one actually gave me that advice. That was just my experience that taught me that. Um, The one bit of advice I do remember, and it might be inappropriate, I don't know, um, was with your students, it was we were worried about how to not how to deliver an effective class, but how to control students, you know, because particularly in China, you'd have maybe 20 students, all nine, 10 years old. Half of them are called Leo. The other half are called a star and they're all hyperactive. And it was a case of, well, how do I actually control these kids? Um, the only advice I was ever given that really stuck was go in hard and soften up. Do not go the other way around. It's impossible to go in soft, be friendly, friendly. It doesn't mean go in like a dictator um, and, you know, scare the, <laughs> scare the pants off your students. But don't, don't go in there too soft. You need to go in with a bit of a authoritative persona, even if it's a young kid class, even if you're just playing nursery rhymes and silly songs and dances and games, still have, you know, remain professional and be, yeah, start off strict and loosen up. Um, it doesn't apply to every element of, 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 of tefling, um, but that's one bit of, of advice that was given to me um, that really, really helped. And I think the best other advice that was given to me was, was by my mother, and that's that three, whether it be three days, three weeks, or three months, these are good numbers to give in terms of building a routine, building a habit, getting used to something. Um, don't decide anything is too much before three months, is what I would always say. Is give it to that point, and you will find then that you've got a really good feel for a job for a country not every shoe is going to fit every foot which is why i've moved around the world it's um well that's not so much the case i mean spain yeah i didn't really enjoy the job there eventually um and therefore i moved on to italy where i wanted to do something that had a little bit less pressure about it uh, a little bit more free time um but otherwise i've just gone with the wind um to be honest um and i think you know the best advice as I said, that I was ever given was by my mum, and that's give it three months. If something doesn't fit, give it three months to really establish whether that shoe does fit or not. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, that's great advice. I've never actually heard that before, but um, that is really, really good advice, especially for people who want to, to teach abroad. Um, I would definitely keep that in mind. Um, I always try to ask TEFL teachers this, um, and again, it might be a really broad question, but what's the lesson you, you most look forward to? Like, is there a specific <laughs> aspect of teaching English that you like more than other aspects? Yeah. um, Funnily enough, 
as a South Londoner, my English wasn't great when I qualified as, as, as a TEFL trainer. In fact, you couldn't even distinguish my F or my THs. I was biting the wrong part of my mouth to actually make the wrong sounds. But it was grammar mm. that terrified me. And I get it quite a lot, actually, uh, in terms of the job that I do now, the, the chats, the calls, the emails. Uh, and it's always from native speakers. Non-natives tend to have a far superior you know, awareness of syntax and grammar than we do as, as native speakers. Um, and actually, grammar, I, I sucked at grammar. And I only just passed the grammar test that was part of my TEFL course at the time. Just, just passed it. Um, and, but my view was that I wanted to become good at it. So I got myself, at, and again, people always ask me, and I, I'm not being paid by Collins, but I do recommend their book <laughs> is a really, really good grammar guide. Back then, it was the pocket guide of grammar. Uh, which was great because it did fit in my pocket. And it meant that any time I was teaching, I could literally turn and reference my book halfway through my class. <laughs> but one thing's for sure, teaching grammar will help you to understand grammar. It's, it kind of sounds a bit, you know, uh, almost paradoxical that, you know, you need to actually teach mm -hmm. it before you can learn it. But the truth is, uh, a teacher is only ever qualified by three classes ahead of a student. That's what makes a teacher in any field. You only actually have to be about three classes ahead of your student to officially be able to teach something. So uh, <laughs> as long as you're kind of, as I said, it was all to do with me. I took, it, I took what I did seriously. I didn't take myself too seriously, but I took the quality of my classes seriously. I took my attention to detail seriously. Uh, and, you, you know, you find that, again, joining a company like EF or a big company where all of the books are provided, all of the course materials are provided, pretty much you can just follow their lessons to the T and still get by. Um, but what I did is I would look at each week day lesson, whichever grammar, you know, if it was a grammatical point that we were teaching, and I would go and learn it. I would go and study it myself. I would go and practice it. I made my own grammar book where I wrote it out. And then it got to the point before I was the director of studies. I think maybe one of the reasons I was was because the other teachers were then coming to me for grammatical advice, which that's still to this day, I think one of my greatest prides is actually overcoming something which was such a challenge to me initially to the point now that I, I, I study linguistics. Um, I, you know, when, when, I, when, when I teach, we, you know, we can really get into the syntax and, and, you know, the different components of the language, the morphology of the words as well. Um, and I found that it's actually something that I, I love and I adore. I genuinely love the grammar. So in terms of what I love teaching most, I love teaching high level grammatical syntax. I really enjoyed that, particularly at the university. Um, lecturing English for academic purposes was a dream come true. My students were all fluent in English already. They were economics majors who lived in Hong Kong. So these guys were smarter than me. Um, but it was brilliant because we got to have debates, seminars, teach them how to give academic presentations, how to um, mark exposition essays, for example. I loved all of that because it really sort of delved into the language. But then I really love con teaching comparative adjectives to eight-year-olds. Uh, lion is more dangerous than a dog, for example, because there's so many fun things you can do with those parts of the language. And, you know, so there were, you know, comparative adjectives were always easy. The future with going to, which is a debatable grammatical point, is something I hate teaching because it's so, just too big to try and condense into one class. That's always caught me out. Um, but no, there are, there are certain grammatical parts that I love to teach. In terms of, you know, cohorts, no, I think it all depends on the cohort themselves. You can have a fantastic group of four-year-olds who are just fun, they're innocent, they're willing to learn, they're even, you know, I, I always tell this story about an eight or nine-year-old kid that I had called Tiger teaching in China, and the class would be 40 minutes, 10-minute break, 40 minutes. Tiger arrived on 38 minutes, and he kicked open the door, poof, the door opened, and he came in eating a tub of the Neapolitan ice cream, you know, the whole tub. He hadn't just brought a cone. He brought a tub of ice cream from home. And he came in and he walked in. Sorry, I'm late, teacher. As he's eating his ice cream, sat down for the minute and a half that was left before the 10 minute break. And then in the second half of the class, we actually had an exam. At the exam. It was a small test based on their course book. And the course book talked about flamingos and the fact that flamingos live in a colony. And one of the questions, now bear in mind, this is, maybe I'm exaggerating, he maybe have been 10, but he wasn't a 12-year-old, he was still maybe single digits, 9, 10 tops. One of the questions from, on the test was, what are the social habits of a flamingo?
and the the, 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 the cue was that they are colonial birds, they live in the colony. Tiger, who's come in eating his Neapolitan on 38 minutes late for class, put in his answer, what are the social habits of a flamingo? I don't know. Go and ask a flamingo. And I, <laughs> my goodness, now this kid gets sarcasm in another language at nine years old. Never mind that he dropped into my class, half, half the class, like kick the door in, eat an ice cream, give the kid an A. Because my goodness, to be able to articulate yourself. So, you know, so again, teaching and these were kind of like the wild kids, difficult to control. But sometimes you just get a, a moment like that. Just, you just, just knocks your pants off and you just you just have to admire them. So. Um, you know, there, there are in then, you know, then I had my B2 adults in Spain who still to this day, we're, we're in WhatsApp groups together. We still keep in touch. Mm -hmm. We went out drinking, went to the beach together. I started, you know, I was invited on family trips to their, you know, their, their campo, their, their, their farmhouse. Um, oh, wow. And then you've got the continuity of if you do stay teaching for a long time, you keep in touch with your students. I have students who are now studying at Cambridge and Oxford that were my EF students in Nanning when they were nine, 10 years old, you know, and it's just like, that, that, that blows huge. your mind. That blows your mind. And I don't think I got them into Cambridge or Oxford necessarily. Why not? But I don't yes, think that I had a hand in there. And just, but just to see them keep in touch with you as adults, um, that's a part of teaching that you just can't put a price on. You know, that's no money in the world can, can offer that kind of a reward. Um, so yeah, difficult to say what I like teaching most um what i like teaching least was that i'll touch on the story of the tobacco factory so i was asked um to as one of the more experienced teachers not just to teach in the school but because the the owner of the school had business interests elsewhere she asked me sometimes mm -hmm. we do a couple of days in a local school sometimes we go into some of the businesses she'd asked me to go into one of the local tobacco factories um, and she promised me it was going to be 10 guys and 10 girls intermediate level so i did a speed dating uh class so you know it wasn't we weren't hoping anyone was going to meet their you know meet their true love but it was just a way of getting everybody intermingling short sharp conversations between the whole class i turned up and there were 50 guys 49 50 guys not a single female 50 guys none of them had even a word of english and i'm there with a speed dating lesson planned for uh intermediates and so then it was a case of literally throwing the lesson plan in the bin and winging it, doing the best I could. Mm. I didn't do great. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think any of them speak English to this day, but we got through it nonetheless. Um, so that was the only class I didn't like. Otherwise, you, had, you will have an odd character here or there, which is more troublesome, which is a bit more facetious potentially. But generally speaking, mm -hmm. for students want to be there. They enjoy being there. And it's a class which, because it's a communicative approach to learning a language, it's not that sit and listen rote to the teacher type of learning. They're always engaged. They're always doing things. And generally speaking, they're always really kind of uh, motivated and willing to partake in your classes. So, yeah, I, I, I love teaching across the board. Amazing. Um, I think we're going to uh, wrap things up there, but I just want to ask you, at the time of recording, um, I know you've just been a week in St. Lucia, um, but with your CV and everything, do you think you could be the Prime Minister? Because there's a job opening uh, <laughs> um, today. Yes, I, I, no, I don't think so, because I don't think anybody could fix the problems that we've made of this country now. Uh, I think we'd be better off just nominating a cabbage and letting them sit, sit in the split seat for a while. Um, living in China for so many years, it gave me an interesting view on democracy, and um, I yeah. think we'll save that for a whole other uh, podcast. But um, I don't think anybody would do a worse job than, the, than they're doing at the moment, put it that way. Well, I think we should definitely schedule in a second episode, Richard. That's that's been amazing. So thank you so much. Um, it's been great chatting it's to you. It's been a pleasure. Um, right. Well, uh, I'm going to leave you with Erin, who's um, going to tell you all about keeping up with the podcast. But again, Richard, thank you, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. You've been listening to I Taught English Abroad, a podcast by the TEFL Org. However you found us, we hope you've subscribed to keep up to date with each episode. And please remember to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, or wherever you found us. To keep up to date with the TEFL Org, you can follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search the TEFL Org and you'll find us. And if you're interested in starting your TEFL journey, 
you can browse our courses and speak directly to an advisor by visiting www.tefl.org. That's www.tefl.org. See you next time. Thank you.